astrophotography. It's something that I've been chipping away at for a couple of years now. Not taking it too seriously, but having a dabble. And I thought I've gained enough experience now to sort of do a little bit of a tutorial and go over the things that I've learned. To shoot astrophotography, you need a camera, a tripod, a wide angle fast lens, a clear night, that really does help, a place with low light pollution, no or small moon. <laughs> small moon? A new moon, a new moon, no moon, moon bad. The moon just makes all the stars disappear. So pick a time of the month where there is no moon. A star app on your phone really can help so you can point in the right direction. There's tons of free versions available on both Android and Apple. A light, so you can see what you're doing because this happens at night. Bear in mind if you use a traditional light you will lose your night vision very quickly. So a red light is sometimes worth investing in. Or if you're a cheapskate like me just wait until your eyes adjust. And another light to illuminate anything that's happening in the foreground is always a good idea because your foreground interest, as I've learnt to my detriment, as you'll see in some of these images, your foreground is often something that you'll forget during astrophotography because you're looking up at the stars and making sure you've got that right. You often forget to expose a frame for your foreground. So if you use a light, I use the one on my phone and just sort of paint during a long exposure to sort of bring out the foreground. Very handy. Most people have a light on the phone. Very easy to do, just don't forget. And a calculator or any basic rudimentary knowledge of maths, which I don't possess, so I use the calculator. And I'll tell you why for all of these things now. The reason that you need a wide angle lens, I have used sort of eight mil or 7.5 mil, so around the 15 mil in, in full frame terms, is there is something called the 500 rule when it comes to astrophotography. This is the equation that you use to make sure you use the right sort of shutter speed, exposure time, before the stars begin to blur and move because the Earth is moving. And the longer you leave your shutter open for, the more you will see the, the stars drift. So we don't want that most of the time, unless you're doing star trails, then you do want that. But for standard astrophotography, you just have to figure out the full frame equivalent of your lens. So if you were shooting 25 mil, it would be a 50 mil in full frame. If you shoot in a 7.5 mil, it would be 15 mil in full frame. And then divide that number by 500. And when you do this equation, you see how important using the appropriate lens becomes because a 7.5 mil lens will give you a 30 second exposure whereas a 25 mil lens will only give you a 10 second exposure before things start to move and that is a huge difference and think how much more information your camera could pick up in that extra 20 seconds and then just for reference a stock lens which is usually 12 mil will give you 20 seconds of exposure which isn't too shabby so even if you want to experiment just with your stock lens you definitely can do the other aspect of your lens choice aside from it being wide is preferably being pretty fast 2.8 or higher higher is better but also more expensive so i'm using a 2.8 lens just because the, the wider the aperture, the more light you get in, the more information you get. Just like any other aspect of photography. In terms of ISO, this is where the Micro Four Thirds cameras can sometimes get a little bit tricky. You want that as high as possible. I dabble <laughs> around 5,000 ISO. Uh, you might have sort of better results higher or lower. If you were using a full frame camera, you could probably ram it up to 10,000 or more. But 5000 ISO with a little bit of editing and a few techniques can get you very, very good results on Micro Four Thirds. So just a quick recap, fast wide lens, figure out your right shutter speed, use a high ISO, as high as you dare. And then we're ready to go. Stick your camera on your tripod and then figure out which way you want 
to point your camera. Now to find the Milky Way, as I say, you can either, if it's a very clear night, you can just about make it out with your eyes. When I went to Arizona, a place called Marble Canyon, you could see the Milky Way with your naked eyes. It was so cool, but I didn't have my tripod. So I only have a mental picture to prove it. Uh, when I was in Wales for New Year, you could actually make out the strip of the Milky Way very faintly with the naked eye. So I didn't need to use the app, I could just sort of figure out where it was and off we go. If it isn't quite as pronounced in the sky when you try this, then use the app. The, the app you can use augmented reality, this is me demonstrating augmented reality. You just wander around and figure out where it is and then compose your shot. There's two schools of thought on camera noise reduction. If you are just going to use a single frame and doing minimal editing, you probably want to keep the camera in camera noise reduction on. If you're going to stack your images in post and do a bit of work with them, I would recommend turning them off. And I'm going to do a whole video on how to edit this stuff. And there's a lot of different techniques and loads of them are free. You'll be very happy to know. I'm going to do a video on that in another topic because it'll be quite packed for one video. But just remember, if you want to edit them a lot, turn off your noise reduction. If you want to edit them minimally, you may as well let the camera do some of the work. The general consensus on the Micro Four Nerds Facebook group, which you should totally join, link down below, is the golden standard for Micro Four Thirds photography is the Laua 7.5mm f2. It is sharp throughout and the absolute amazing astrophotography photos that I've seen on the group have usually come from that lens. However, it ain't the cheapest. I'll leave a link for you to check it out. But if you want to do astrophotography affordably, like me, where you only do it every so often, it's not your key plan in life to be an astrophotographer, the Seven Artisans 7.5mm f2.8, so slightly slower, but a similar style of lens, is tons cheaper. It's tons cheaper. I've yet to actually use it properly in daylight, so I'll do a proper review of it in a few weeks probably, but for the astrophotography I've been super impressed with it so far, and it's cheap. I've also used my Leica 25mm f1.4, which as we figured out with the um, 500 rule, it does give you a shorter sort of length of exposure time. But because it is an f1.4 lens, you do let in quite a bit of light. So the shutter speed is slower, but you let more light in with the aperture. So it wasn't terrible. Uh, the results were pretty good with that lens. And I've also used the Maker 12mm f2.8 and also my stock lens, uh, which is 12mm f2.8. So I'll put some examples of that here as well. So now it comes to getting the correct sort of exposures for the results that you want when you finished editing. And there are a few ways to go about this. As I mentioned, the easiest way is if you're just doing one exposure, probably keep your noise reduction on in camera, set your camera up, if you have an interesting foreground, it would be a great opportunity to light paint the foreground so that you, you've got something interesting and you don't have to pull out the shadows and make the foreground really noisy. And then just hope for the best and, and get as much information that you can in that one frame. If you are stacking your images, which I highly recommend you do, um, there's a very affordable app on Mac and it's free on Windows and you can do it in Photoshop as well, which I will go through in depth in the next video. What you're going to want to do is get at least 10 exposures. So just sort of take a shot, wait a second or two for it to save to your camera and then take another shot, take another shot, etc. until you have at least 10 or more. You want to keep everything exactly the same if you're stacking it. So keep your ISO the same, keep your shutter speed the same, keep everything the same and just shoot off a number of frames. Also added bonus if you are setting yourself up for success to stack is put your lens cap back on and take an exposure or two with your lens cap on. What this does is you'll end up with a blank frame with dots of noise and what that is is your sensor noise. So when you stack everything together in post-production the software will go okay these dots are sensor noise, these dots are stars, let's remove the noise, keep the stars, and you end up with a really clean image. That's what stacking does. 
it takes away the noise and then keeps everything else clear, also known as magic. So one, make sure you take a photograph with your foreground in mind. Don't just concentrate on the stars because if you have the greatest stars in the world and your foreground is noisy and horrible, it's a bad image. Light painting is your friend. Two, if it's a cold night, stick a battery in your bra or an inside pocket. You will go through your battery quite quickly in the dark, in the cold, so keep your batteries warm to preserve battery life. Preserve your night vision. The GH5 actually has a red screen mode, which is awesome. Uh, a lot of the star tracking apps will have a red mode because they know that you're gonna be outside at night using it. If you have a red camping light, like a headlight or whatever, use the red light because the red light keeps your night vision. If you don't have access to a red light, just wait until your eyes have adjusted and hope for the best. Don't do what I did in Wales, which was walk out in the dark and I was in awe of the stars and walked straight into the picnic bench. <laughs> I got like a bruise on my shin the size of a golf ball. So don't do what Emily does. A lot of this channel, in fact, is just don't do what I do. Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> if you are doing time lapses at night, also remember to leave a big enough interval for your camera to sort of buffer and save each photograph before the next one starts. Or you can get into a trouble mess. For instance, I used, say, a 30 second exposure, but set my interval time to 35 or 40 seconds. That way, you know, each image is safe and stored on your cards before the next one starts. And another tip for your battery life is if you are doing a time lapse, which with the long exposures can be going for numerous hours, when everything is up and running, turn your screen off. I toggle mine to just live view. So the live view stays on, but the screen stays off. And that way, one, you know, the battery life will be better because it's not powering a huge screen. And two, when you come out to check on it, you'll not lose your night vision because the screen will be off. So there we go. There are some beginner's tips to trying astrophotography. If you have any more tips, do let me know below because as I say, I am still learning myself and I really enjoy seeing what you guys come up with. If you've done astrophotography, we've seen some great shots recently on the Facebook group. So join into the chat there and share your work. I'd love to see it. Thank you very much for watching.